All eyes on 2016, not the election. How about the colonization? Billionaire Elon Musk wants to bring humans to Mars. To Mars. And he wants to start taking the big steps early next year. Former astronaut Tom Jones. Uh, I guess, Tom, you'd wish him well, right? I mean, uh, he's going to need a lot of help, but what do you think of it? Oh, I do. I'm glad that somebody's getting started sooner rather than later. That's uh, been NASA's chronic problem is to get people into deep space again out beyond the space station. And it's been very tough with a flat NASA budget over the last 10 or 15 years. Elon's saying that he's going to uh, start this process up, perhaps unmanned flights to put robots on Mars, and then he's going to figure out a way to get humans there, he says. But we've done the, the unmanned spacecraft on Mars a number of times, so that would be doing what we've done. But you're right. He is saying whatever he's going to do, he's going to be doing on his own, maybe with some rich friends, deep-pocketed buddies. How realistic is that? Because that would be a formidable undertaking, right? It's a really tough technical problem. It's going to take, in my view, 25 or 30 years of homework, new propulsion systems, really? much more reliable life support required. We've got to find out how to uh, safeguard astronauts from the radiation. But what he can do is he can attack the launch cost end of it, how to get all of this machinery up into space for something that's affordable. And that's where his innovations can really pay off. You know, Tom, you and I have chatted about this before, but I think we need a vision again, whether it's a JFK vision. I know that was born of a Cold War, et cetera. But we need a vision or a goal, and whether it's landing man at Mars, I don't know. But with SpaceX and now with another launch plan tomorrow to, to get stuff up to the International Space Station, what have you, at least we wouldn't be hitching rides with the Russians. How soon do you think at least that part ends, that we're not dependent on others to just get to space? Well, again, there's no emergency uh, uh, directive from the administration to speed that process up. It looks still to me like 2018 before we start flying humans out of Cape Canaveral to the space station, Americans in particular. And that's uh, par partially uh, Elon's job, but Boeing's also competing with him for that contract. And I think we do need a directive from our, our leaders, Congress, the president, to say Mars is the firm long-term goal. And in the meantime, we've got to start industrializing, building an economy in space to partially pay for these future missions to get astronauts to visit and then colonize Mars. What do you think of the Chinese making the moon the focus, a launching point for, you know, pretty much everything they plan to do in space? I think this is a calculation on their part that the moon is doable. Of course, they've seen it done by other nations right, in the right. past. And uh, it's a near enough goal that's splashy enough that they think they can get some uh, propaganda mileage out of it. But would I it get any they're... mileage, Tom, because it's been there, done that? You know, I mean, it seems like, really? But I they... guess they're using that as a base, right? Well, they say, they'll say, first of all, that they can do it and nobody else can. And that would yeah. be true. Uh, we don't have that capability. And I think there's a lot of hope that water on the moon, other uh, metallic resources can be used to establish and sustain an outpost there. And they may do that for propaganda purposes. I think the moon uh, really offers the long-term hope that we can produce rocket fuel uh, there on the moon. And that would, might lower the cost of getting people way out into deep space to the asteroids and Mars. Uh, the asteroids offer the same prospect. And as you know, there are some um, private mining companies that hope to do just that. And I think that's very promising for helping to industrialize space, make a profit there. And that might eventually lead to people going to Mars on commercial auspices. I think you just hit on it. it. It might not be the vision thing as much as the money, profit thing. That might drive this. We'll, we'll watch closely. Tom, Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Explain a little bit. The first section of the rocket, which fell off as the rocket started to reach orbit, uh, was the part that they tried to land on the, auto what does he call it? He calls it the Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship, which I would call a big barge. Yeah, but the, the capsule made it to the space station. So let's, let's talk about the autonomous spaceport drone ship first. Isn't, isn't that just a barge? Yeah, well, it's a pretty sophisticated barge. But if you saw one, you, you just describe it as a barge. What's sophisticated about it is it can hold position using a bunch of different propellers underwater. So it, it'll, uh, using a GPS, it can stay in one place really precisely, which is what you need when that piece of the rocket ship is coming back and trying to land on it like, like a big broomstick landing on, uh, imagine if you could balance a broomstick while you're out at sea. It's a pretty specific thing to do. But yeah, the, the barge just came back into port yesterday and uh, they came close, but not perfect yet. All right, so let's talk about what happened in space. The capsule got there, the robotic arm reached out and grabbed it. Describe that process to me and, and what you've seen when you've done it. Yeah, we did it uh, exactly the same thing when I was on the space station. It's really precise. The, uh, the unmanned spaceship, which was launched a few days ago, flies all the way up, gets close to the space station, 
and then shuts everything off, basically. Once it's perfectly there, nice and still, the two of us orbiting the world together, it shuts off everything, and then you reach out quickly with the great big robot arm. In this case, it was a, a guy on board named Butch Wilmore. Butch reached out, uh, helped by uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, grabbed onto the, the Dragon spaceship, uh, sort of like plucking a dragon out of, out of the air and then pull it down and attached it. And right now, up on the space station, they're opening the hatches and getting to all the, uh, the Christmas presents and everything else, about two tons of stuff that was inside. There are, uh, of course, always the mystery experiments. Uh, uh, what do we know about the experiments that they're doing, and, and how does that work on the International Space Station when there are scientific experiments that are part of those cargoes that come through? Uh, this particular Dragon spaceship is carrying gear to support about 250 different experiments. Some of them are looking at, uh, at how the, the gases and liquids are transported in the atmosphere, so to try and understand atmospheric physics better. There's, there's experiments studying radiation, um, studying crew health. Uh, there, there's a whole, whole uh, months and months worth of experiments on board, as well as just straight resupply, of course, food, clothes, all, all the things you need just to live up in space. But it's, it's an amazing little ship, and especially with the accident we had in the fall with, with the competing ship uh, with Orbital Sciences, uh, everyone was really counting on this one. It was really nice this morning for Butch to reach out and grab it and to get the hatch open. Indeed. Now let's talk about why this uh, landing of the first stage of the rocket is so important to this space industry. What is it that's so uh, groundbreaking? Uh, should they able to be able to pull this off? And why has no one been able to do it in the past? Well, maybe as a parallel, imagine if every time you got on an airliner, uh, when you landed, they had to throw away three quarters of the airliner and build it over again. The cost of each flight would be huge. Um, but if you could reuse that every single time, if you could, like an airliner does, land it, and then all you have to do is refuel it, make sure it's serviceable, check the oil, and then use it again, it decreases the cost significantly. And up until now, uh, the first stage, the, the part of the rocket that gets you above the air and gets you going fast, that first stage has always just been thrown away because it's, it's simpler. But now maybe... Our, our ability and our technology, our computers are far enough along that there's a safe way to bring one back and land it. And we'd like to land it on land, but you don't want your first test where, where it's probably not going to work right. You don't want your first test to, to crash into the ground. So what SpaceX did was they uh, modified this great big barge. They put it safely out at sea, and they're trying to land that first stage rocket, sort of like a big telephone pole, come back and land on this barge. And once they've demonstrated that they can do that, then we'll give it a try on land. And once that gets proven, it will decrease the cost of going to space significantly, enough that it will really open things up. It's, it's an important historic bit of technology to make space access uh, more affordable and therefore more capable.